Let's stand together as we sing all three verses of Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing. This morning we're talking about sin and the life of a saint. You see, we're having revival next week. And revival always takes on many different forms. Sometimes when a people like many of you have been so burdened with cares or trials or upheavals in your life, you get worn down physically, mentally, and spiritually. And many times revival is a renewal for those who have been struggling with hardships in life. Sometimes revival is a renewed sense of call and purpose where sometimes we get off track. Our relationship with Jesus is, is important, but sometimes cares of this world and the things we have going on seem to take precedence over everything else. And in the midst of revival, God reminds us that he is to be first in our lives. But no matter how revival happens, one thing that is always a constant in revival, when there's truly an outpouring of revival, there is always this revival of holiness. You see, God did not call us to be happy. He called us to be holy. But in our holiness, we find happiness. And so I'm talking to you this morning about the effects of sin and the life of a saint. 
And so I hope that our revival next week will meet your needs and the Holy Spirit will meet you right where you are. But I hope above all that there is a renewed sense of the call to holiness in every one of our lives. Let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for all of those who have come. Lord, I pray that you would encounter them this morning with your Holy Spirit's presence. Lord, I just imagine as I look amongst my brothers and sisters, I know the love that they have for you. And Lord, I know the sincerity of their faith. And Lord, I'm praying that sometimes as we get distracted, we need those distractions removed. So I'm praying that during this morning, during our service, the distractions that would keep us from experiencing you would be removed and that we could just have a wonderful time of worship and fellowship with you. Lord, touch their hearts today. Thank you for Miss Kathy and this wonderful choir and the musicians. Lord, I ask for your blessings upon them as they lead us in worship. And may you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to welcome all of you here to our church family. I love Union Baptist Church. I'm just going to be honest with you. Brenda and I love being here. And I love the opportunities that I get to be with each of you individually. And I'm so grateful for that. If you are a visitor here this morning and you're looking for a church family, I'd like to tell you, welcome home. One time I was looking for big and tall men's clothing and I went to the men's warehouse in Mobile, Alabama. And they said, oh, uh, well, you need to go to the store across the road there. And it was called DXL. And I walked into that store and I said, where's your big and tall section at? And she said, baby, welcome home. This whole store is for big and tall folks. <laughs> and I realized what DXL stood for, the extra large store. But I want to welcome you home to a church family that would love you and love worshiping and serving with you. If you're joining us today by live stream, well, you may not be here, but you're present with us in spirit. And we want to welcome you into our worship time. And so grateful that above all, the Holy Spirit is here. Amen. Now, if you would, if you're a visitor here, look in the pew in front of you and pull out that, mem that uh, visitor card and fill it out. It's not a membership card. <laughs> it's a visitor card. Fill it out and put it in the hands of our men when you leave today. And they have a gift for you. And I'd like to contact you and pray with you and see how we can minister to you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so glad you all are here. But most of all, I'm glad that Jesus is here. Amen. And we're about to worship him. One last thing. This Wednesday night at 630, we're going to have a prayer time right in here in our sanctuary. So it's for anyone who wants to show up. And we're praying for Dr. Digby, praying for our revival services, praying for our attendance, praying for the spirit to move. And I would like, if you have the time, if you can make the time to invite you into a worship and pray, or to a prayer service just for our revival this coming Wednesday. Miss Kathy, thank you for leading us today. Let's let this next song that we sing be a prayer. It says, with all my heart, I want to love you, Lord, and live my life each day to know you more. All that is in me is yours completely. I'll serve you only with all my heart. Let's sing this through twice. <laughs>
much, much deeper within. for you. Failure is not final. Amen. You may fall, but you can always come back. You can always be picked up. Such is the case for King David. King David was and is a man that we revere highly in our Christian faith. Of all of the personalities in the Old Testament, David, probably the most prominent. He had such uh, personalities as being called the man after God's own heart. The man who seemed to face fear and triumph over it. But even as great of an example as David was, he's ultimately even a type of Christ. When, when we say type of Christ, he wasn't Christ, but he typified in the Old Testament what Christ would be in the New Testament. David was a shepherd, and our Lord is the good shepherd. David was anointed king. Our Savior is the king of kings. 
And so he typified Christ back in the Old Testament. But even David stumbled. So ladies and gentlemen, failure is not final. I want you to turn with me to the book of Psalm. And we're looking at the 51st Psalm this morning. And in looking at the 51st Psalm, we are able to see the effects of David's great failure on his own spirit. Psalm 51. When you have it, please stand with me in reverence of the Word of God. I love preaching the Psalms. And I want to encourage, I love studying the Psalms. I want to encourage you that whenever you read a Psalm, don't read it in haste. Don't jump straight to the first verse and start reading. What I would encourage you to do is everything in the Bible is important. You believe that? Amen. Now, David and all of the psalm writers did not put headings on their psalms. People later put the reasons for the psalm on there. But when you read a psalm, Stephen, go back and read why the psalm was written. Many times throughout the psalms, they have headings up there. And I want you to start with me by looking at the heading of Psalm 51. For the choir director, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone in to, Beth to Bathsheba. I want to encourage you that in your personal studies, if you're reading the Psalms and you see a heading like that, go back in the scriptures to where that actually occurred and read that and then read the Psalm. We're going to do that this morning. But first, let's read Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purify me with the hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy and gladness, and let, me, let, let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. I do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in the sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. No, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, will you not despise. By your favor, do good design, build the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in righteous sacrifices and the burnt offerings and whole offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy Lord, I stand here before your people, fully convinced of the awesome weight of this task of sharing your word. Lord, I know that it's not a sermon they need. It's not wit and witticism. But, oh God, it's your Holy Spirit speaking directly into their heart. They don't need a sermon. They need an encounter with God. And, Lord, here I stand in need 
of an encounter with you. It is me, O oh God, as we say, that's in need of revival. And Lord, I look at my brothers and sisters out here. I just wonder, are there any hearts that need encouraged this morning? Are there any that need corrected? Are there any that need guidance? Are there any who need help? Lord, I'm praying for all of them. But Lord, you would just touch them where they are. Thank you for them, Lord. I love them dearly. But it's nothing in comparison to the great and vast love which you have for them. To die on the cross for them. And to save them, Lord. And for those who aren't saved, to call them to repentance. Lord, thank you. And I pray in the solemnness of this moment that your Holy Spirit would speak to them. Put your words in my mouth and your meditations in my heart. Lord, may I speak the glories of God. Forgive me of my sin that I could be a clean and yielded vessel before you. That I could do like David asked. That I could open my lips to teach transgressors your ways and to proclaim the praises of God. Lord, may it be done so now for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Here we have the wonderful account. Notice what I said. Wonderful account. Now what David did was a tragedy. But what God did was amazing. A wonderful account of God issuing a call of repentance to his servant David. And then David having the wherewithal, Brother Roger, to heed the call of God to repentance and then to actually do it. We can look at the life of David and see what happened when he had fallen and how God so graciously restored him. Ladies and gentlemen, we can look at this passage, as I said, this wonderful example of what it is to be restored. I want you, no matter where you are in your Christian walk, to experience God this morning and have him speak directly into your heart. So that he can encounter you and touch you in a deep way. I remember back when I was a teenage boy, it was August. Uh, well, I was about 19 or so. It was August of 1990. My mom was going out of town with my dad. And it was summertime, Brother Paul. And us country boys love to go out and swim in creeks. How many of you swim in a creek? I heard about the Bowley going swimming in it. Or uh, what's the one right up here? How many of y'all have swam in them, those creeks? I remember right before my mama left to go out of town, Tanya, she said, Now, Bruce, don't be diving in any creeks or rivers. Well, lo and behold, we went out to the top of Saw Creek, just north of Macomb. It was on a, I don't know, Saturday, Sunday, I can't remember. But there was a swing, Brother Don. And I got on that swing, and it was about 10 to 15 feet off of the water. And I swung out, Brother Roger, looked like Tarzan. And I, sw I, swung, I swung out there, and I kicked my feet and threw that swing, and I went in head first. And the hole that I was supposed to hit was around eight to 10 foot deep. But I hit where it was four foot deep. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I came up off of the bottom of that creek. My lip was gashed wide open. My nose was broke and my spine had suffered some damage. My cousin says, boy, come here. He was, he was with me. It wound up him taking me to the hospital to have me examined. And the doctor said, son, you are just blessed. It's a miracle that you did not break your neck. Lo and behold, I had to tell mama what had happened to me. <laughs> Cause just as sure as the good Lord made little green apples, she had told me not to be diving in it. And what did I do? As Soon as mama was gone, I dove into the creek. Now, lo and behold, five years later, a mutual friend gives Brenda information about me and she calls me and tells me about Brenda. 
And I called Brenda and we agreed to meet. We're about to meet for the first time. And as soon as we got off the phone, you know, the phone call I told y'all, I asked her if she can make cornbread. She got off of the phone and called her sister-in-law, Melissa. Melissa and I graduated together. And I remember thinking, Melissa's going to make somebody a good wife one day. And lo and behold, I didn't realize that she was going to become my sister-in-law. But anyway, she said, Melissa, didn't you graduate Boca Chitta? Melissa said, yes, I did. Wasn't 1990? Yes, 1990. Did you know a guy named Bruce McKenzie? And Melissa and I were real good friends. And all of a sudden, Melissa, who is very quiet, got deathly quiet. And she said, uh, yeah. What do you know about him? Well, I don't know. I hadn't seen him since we graduated, but I heard after we graduated, he had a diving accident and messed his face all up. <laughs> so Brenda starts panicking, Chris. She says, what in the world is about to walk into my house tomorrow night? She thought I was going to look like Freddy Krueger, you know, the hamburger meat. And lo and behold, she wasn't far off, but... <laughs> Now, I'm telling you that for a reason. My mama had told me not to dive into the creek. Now, did mama tell me that because she didn't want me to have any fun? Was that the reason she said that? What was mama's reason for telling her son not to dive into the creek? She didn't want me to get hurt. Ladies and gentlemen, the world out there looks at the commands of God and thinks God just doesn't want us to have any fun. But the truer story is, it's not that God doesn't want us to have any fun. God doesn't want us to be hurt. Whenever God says, thou shalt not, he's saying, don't hurt yourself, as I heard Adrian Rogers put it. And whenever the Lord says, thou shalt, he's saying, help yourself to happiness. Ladies and gentlemen, when God tells us things that are sin, he's not telling us that just because he doesn't want us to have fun and experience joy in this life. No, he's telling us that because he knows that will hurt us. And he knows the true way and the right way to joy and happiness is to abide in his word. Now, ladies and gentlemen, David knew God. Of all of the people in the Bible, David possibly knew God more than anyone else. Moses knew him. Elijah knew him. But David knew the Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, his walk with God impacted his whole life. And he was the one as a young boy who overcame the giant when everybody else was afraid. And he slew the giant with a rock. And he said the quote famed passage, this battle is the Lord's and not Israel's. He was a spiritual giant. Later on, he's anointed king three times, not once, not twice, three times David was anointed king. God's chosen man. He was the one whom God himself said is a man after my own heart. He was a spiritual giant. But then one day he walks out on the top of his castle. And his castle is taller than anybody else's. Anybody else's home. And he sees this beautiful woman there on top of her house bathing in the sunlight. He starts harboring lust in his heart. The next thing you know, he is inviting her over to his castle. I could just see it. When she walks in, there's the first inappropriate glance. Uh, the first inappropriate look. The, the first inappropriate statement. Ladies and gentlemen, failure doesn't happen all at once. It happens bit by bit with one poor decision after another. And all of a sudden, there's this first inappropriate touch. 
And the next thing you know, Bathsheba and David are in an adulterous relationship and David has her husband killed. Regardless of what it would cost Bathsheba, what it would cost Uriah, even the child that would ultimately be born and die as a result. David wanted his own gratification over anything else. First of all, don't tell me that your sin only impacts you. Uriah, who is righteous and doing the just and right thing, he's fighting for King David, ultimately dies as a result of what David did. But Sheba lost a son. And think about the baby that was born. He had no fault and fight whatsoever in this matter, and he died. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want you to fall into thinking that your sin only affects you. It will affect everybody around you. Secondly, I want you to realize that sin not only affects everybody around you, even great spiritual giants can get off track. What do you do when you get off track? How do you come back on track with the Lord? Well, that's what this sermon is about. First of all, as we see this, I want you to notice the confrontation. David does this thing, and it takes some time for it to develop. What is the normal gestation cycle of a woman? 40 weeks, nine months. Nathan comes in, and we're going to see that this baby that Bathsheba has conceived is going to die. It took some time for this to develop. What I want you to see, first of all, is the confrontation. And for us to see that, we've got to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 7 through 15 for just a moment. Verses 1 through 6, the prophet Nathan has been told by God, go to David and tell him about his sin. So Nathan goes there and he tells David this story, this parable about this one rich man who had a whole bunch of lambs and a sojourner came and instead of taking his, one of his own lambs, who, when he had plenty, he took this one little ewe lamb from his neighbor, killed it and offered it to his sojourner, his visitor. It'd be the equivalent of my family coming or someone coming to stay at my house and I go take your cow to feed it to him. And that's what David did. And David got wroth. He said, the man that did this shall surely die. And before he dies, he's going to pay back four times what he's taken. And then Nathan says the famed statement. David, thou art the man. Now we're going to see what Nathan continues to tell David. Nathan then said to David. You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. It is I who anointed you king over Israel. It is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. Also, I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. He had, his, had Uriah killed, Bathsheba's husband, and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, though word excuse me, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you and from your own household, I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them into your companion and he will 
lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, and the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed, you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. Now, ladies and gentlemen, sin is a grievous thing. I want you to realize that even great spiritual giants like David sin and fall into sin. But ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't mean that it's all right to hang out there and continue in it. I remember one time I was studying for a sermon series that I have preached. Maybe I'll preach it here one day called Becoming a Champion, the Life of David. And it had four sermons in it. The first one was the calling of a champion. And it was the three anointings of David. The second one was the fight in a champion. We talked about his fight with the giant. Number three was the failure of a champion. And number four was the legacy of a champion. And I remember when I was studying the failure of a champion. As I read through that and studied. And I saw what David did, Miss Kathy. The Lord made me keenly aware. That if it could happen to a man after his own heart, I'd be a fool to think that failure can't happen to me. And then if you think about his son, Solomon, if it could happen not only to the man after God's own heart, but Jeffrey, to the wisest man that ever lived. I would be a fool to think that failure can happen to me. And ladies and gentlemen, as you're sitting there in your seat, I want to tell you, if you think failure and sinfulness can't happen to you, you are sadly mistaken. Amen. If you don't stay on top of your spiritual walk with Jesus, you too will find yourself in the trouble that David was in. But ladies and gentlemen, I've come to tell you that if you fail, you have an advocate before the father and his name is Jesus Christ. Just do what David did and immediately turn to him and not hide. Amen. Don't do like Adam. You see, in this confrontation, after Samuel tells him all of the stuff that he had told him, David did not try to reason out why he sinned. Well, Lord, you know, that just kind of happens or it's men are like that. David didn't make an excuse for it. And can I tell you, sometimes we are really good at making excuses and justifying why we have done what we have done. You know, which one I hear the most. Well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace and the Lord loves me just like I am. And you're right, he does love you just the way you are. But as I tell you all of the time, he loves you too much to leave you the way that you are. We justify our sin and say, well, everybody else does it. But David didn't try to justify, make excuses. Immediately, he confessed. He said, I have sinned before God. I have sinned against God. And his confession came out. And that's why Nathan said, yep, you sinned, but God has forgiven your sin. But it's going to cost you. Can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? Don't hide from God, but immediately confess your sins to him. Not only did they have this confrontation, but then David had the conviction, point number two. He was convicted by his sin. He felt guilty. He knew immediately that the word of God was right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to caution you. 
If you can live a sinful lifestyle and not be convicted by it, you have a cause to worry. Here's why. Because in the book of Hebrews, first of all, Ms. Weta says that God chastens those whom he loves. Now, there's no way that you as a child of God who bear his image and his Holy Spirit dwells within you can live in a sinful lifestyle and be okay and God not chasten and correct you. If you're not getting corrected by God, then ladies and gentlemen, you may not be a child of God at all. That's harsh to say, but I didn't say it. The writer of Hebrews said it. Secondly, if you can continue in a sinful lifestyle, either, and it not bother you, either God's not correcting you. By the way, I heard a great preacher once say, if you had to raise your children all over again, what would you do differently? He said, I'd ask God, and when they stepped out of line, they'd zap them. Now, some of y'all's children will be getting zapped quite frequently. But no, he's saying that because the Lord lovingly rebukes his children. He's wanting his children to be corrected by God because that means they're saved. But secondly, ladies and gentlemen, either you're not a child of God if you're not getting corrected, or here's a great danger. You are a child of God but you have so calloused your heart that God can't hardly speak to you anymore. You can so harden your heart that it gets calloused. How many of you have ever gotten calluses before? How many of you ever operated a post hole digger? That is probably the fastest thing you can get Boosters and calluses on. By the way, y'all know I'm working on my doctorate degree, right? But I already have two PhDs. I have a public high school diploma and a post hole digger. <laughs> I'm already piled high and deep. You know? <laughs> but you take that post hole digger, when you first use it, you'll get blisters. But if you keep using it, you'll get calluses. And so it is. The more you resist the will of God in your life, those blisters that once hurt will stop hurting because they've turned to calluses. And you will so harden your heart that it's almost impossible for God to get through to you. My prayer Brother Ladonis, quite often, has Lord removed the calluses of my heart. Amen. Please, God, help me to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. I don't ever want to lose my sensitivity to the Lord's leadership in my life. I want to remain soft and pliable in his hand, something that he can work with. So David, that's what he did. He confessed his sin Secondly, or thirdly, oh, bef before I move on, I want to read to you this definition. I looked up in Merriam-Webster's dictionary what conviction was, and I love the way she worded it. Conviction. Now, there's three definitions under there. You know, one is when you have a strong belief about something. Brother Tommy, you know, many people have, a, have an opinion. How many of you are opinionated? Most Baptists are, and they tell you all about it. An opinion is something that you hold. You might have an opinion that Mississippi State is the greatest college team. But a conviction, in one sense of the word, is something that holds you. I am convicted that, G or I'm convicted. I have the uh, strong opinion that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only means of salvation. That's a conviction. But a second meaning of the word is this. The state 
of being convinced of error and compelled to admit the truth. The state of being convinced of an error and compelled to admit the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what conviction is. It is confessing the truth. Point number three, not only the confrontation, not only the conviction, but here's the part where you see sin affecting the life of a saint. And it's in David's confession. As you read down through this, you hear him say things like, Lord, against you and you only have a sin. Let's look at verse, verse one and two. Be gracious to me according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgression. Here it is. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Later on down in the Psalm, he says, wash me with the hyssop and I shall be whiter than snow. If you as a child of God sin, it will make you feel soiled and dirty. I got him. Tell you something, Brother Denson. I don't know if you know about this, but last week I talked about the Mexican cheese on my tie in my sermon. Or I talked about the sauce on the chip that drips on my shirt and my white shirt, has, it, it just irritates me. I get home from church a little while later, my dear brother in Christ, Brandon Gall, sends me a picture of one of his children and they're at the Mexican restaurant and cheese is just all over this youngin's face and clothes. <laughs> Sin soils the saint. It's amazing, though, when you confess your sin, how clean you feel. I was fishing with some of our dear brothers in Christ this past week, and we wound up catching 40 head. Doug caught 39 of them, but <laughs> no, nah, it wasn't quite like that. But we caught those fish. We cleaned those fish. We fried those fish. And I noticed when we got through, my clothes seemed to have this alluring odor. <laughs> well, I stuffed them down in a bag. And I came home yesterday. And Brenda said, go put your clothes in the washing machine. And I opened up that bag and, whoo, good gravy. She said, don't start them, just put them in there. I put them in there, and a little while later, Brenda comes by. She had started my clothes. I said, do you smell anything? She said, oh, yeah, I smell something. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, sin soils the saint. It makes you feel dirty and unclean. Sin stings the conscience. David had said, Lord, it is against you, and you only have I sinned, and my sin is ever before me. Two things about that. He said against you and you only have I sinned. But what happened to Uriah the Hittite? Wouldn't you think that he had sinned against Uriah? I mean, ultimately he died because of what David had de devised. Uh, what about the child who was just conceived and now has died within just a few days of birth? Don't you think that was an injustice before God to the child? But here's the thing. It wasn't Uriah the Hittite or that child that was the law giver. It is God Almighty who declares what is right and what is wrong. And so David didn't violate Uriah's laws. David violated God's. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to realize that when you are involved in sin, you are violating the law of God. He said against you and you only have I sinned. And my sin is ever before me. His conscience, Brother Jim, was getting the best of him. It was eating him up. As a matter of fact, it's all he could think about. Now that Nathan has confronted him. 
like God told him to. His sin was ever before him and it was staying on his mind. And he's come to the stark reality that what all has transpired in his life is a result of his own wrongdoing and he can't think about anything else. Ladies and gentlemen, when you get serious about sin, sin will sting your conscience as well. And you just won't be able to rest until you get it right. The one thing I love about confessing my sin, there's so much I love about it, that God is gracious. Notice in verse one, he said, to, you know, he's appealing to his graciousness. Be gracious, oh God, according to your loving kindness. I love that God is always gracious when I sin. But secondly, I love that after I have confessed my sin, I have a sense of confidence in whatever I'm facing in life because I know that I'm right with God. Sin stings the conscience. Sin sours the spirit. When Nathan confronted him, he said, there's this man with a lamb, you know, the, his only lamb, and there's this guy that had a whole bunch of them. David got very wroth. Sometimes the most sour person you will ever encounter is a Christian who is out of fellowship with God. And over and over throughout this Psalm, David says, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. He's very soured in his spirit. It sealed his lips. Sin sickens the body. He says, the bones which you have crushed. He's been sick. And sometimes I have seen occasion where sin causes sickness in the body. John, 1 John, talks about the sin that leadeth unto death. That sometimes when a person who lives uh, a Christian life gets out of the will of God and so persists in their disobedience that God calls them home. Sin sickens the body. Sin saps of joy. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, do you not have any joy in your life? Sin not only saps the joy, but sin seals the lips. He said, when you forgive me and restore to me the joy of my salvation and renew a steadfast spirit within me, then I will teach evildoers your ways and transgressors will be converted. Your witness is affected when you have sin and rebellion in your life. And God wants to use you as a channel of blessing to bless other people around you. But when you're living in a disobedient, sinful lifestyle, God can't use you. And it seals your lips from being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And even if you try to witness, it's an ineffective witness because people are looking at you and you're just like them. James Merritt, a great Southern Baptist pastor, once asked the question, is your life a mirror or a window? When you are a mirror, people living out in the worldly sinful lifestyle look at you and because of your lifestyle, you look just like them. And it's just like them looking in a mirror. As a Christian, our life should be a window where they look at us and they see Jesus Christ. Not that we are Jesus Christ, but that our character, our morality, our lifestyles are actually Christian which means Christ-like. Our witness is affected. You think your sin only affects you? It's hindering God using you to bless other people around you. James says it like this, the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And when you have unconfessed sin in your life, it hinders your effectiveness of witnessing to other people. But not only is your witness affected, your worship is affected. 
Restore to me this joy. Then I shall sing of your praises. Your worship's not right. Listen, I believe that you cannot lose your salvation. And I'm so glad that I'm not of the mindset that any time I sin, I lose my salvation until I confess my sin over to the Lord. People who think like that, well, they're thinking about sins of commission, something they do that they're not supposed to do. But there's also sins of omission where you don't do what you are supposed to do. And so if you can lose your sin because of something you've done you're not supposed to do, if you can use, lose your salvation because of something you've done you're not supposed to do, then you can also lose it for something you were supposed to do but didn't. But I'm so glad that I don't believe the scriptures teach that. No, you don't lose your salvation when you're a saint and you have sin. You don't lose your relationship but your fellowship will be broken. Your fellowship with God will be hindered. Not only will your witness be hindered, your worship will be hindered. I was born to Thomas Gerald McKenzie back in September 24th, 1971. He's my dad. And there's nothing I can ever do that's going to change that. Even if dad and I had never talked again, he's still my father. Our relationship was intact, but our fellowship might have been broken. And so it is when you are born again, your relationship with Jesus will never be changed, but your fellowship can be hindered. Confess your sin and he will restore you. My concern is that we in our Western culture don't take our sin serious enough. We pass it off and don't give it the due weight that it, was, that it deserves. Sin in the life of a saint is devastating. But I've come to tell you, praise the Lord Jesus Christ, that he restores the joy of your salvation. Would you please stand with me? Now today... Maybe you have never been saved or born again. And you feel compelled, convicted that you need to ask Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. Maybe today he's revealed himself to you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that here in just a moment. The way you would do that is pray this prayer that I'm going to lead you in. It's not the prayer that saves you. It is your turning from sin to follow Jesus that saves you. It's your faith in him. That saves you. But maybe you're already a Christian. And maybe you like our spiritual giant. And man whom we all adore and appreciate. King David. Maybe you've gotten off track. And today you need to rededicate your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Offer yourself a fresh and a new. I've had to do that on many occasions over my life. And I can tell you that the times in my life where I was walking in fellowship with Christ has always been greater than the times that I wasn't. And maybe you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. Perhaps the Lord's calling you here to be a member of this church body. And you want to move your membership. And when the Lord's leading you somewhere, he's planning on feeding you there and he's needing you there. So if he's leading you here, he's planning on feeding you here spiritually, and he's needing you here physically. He's got a calling for you. And we'd love to welcome you with open arms into our church family. Maybe you want to pray over something that's happening in your life. You just want to come to the altar, spend some time praying with God. When you lay things here at the altar and you get up to go back to your seat, don't pick it up and take it back with you. Leave it at the feet of Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. <clears throat> if you would like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, pray this way with me. And say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. 
save me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that you rose again, guaranteeing that I could be forgiven and have eternal life. Save me, Jesus, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Just pray that. Save me, Jesus. I surrender my life to you. Thank you for loving me so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed to ask Jesus in your heart, you just come forward, take me by the hand. Or if you have any other decision that you've made today, you come during this time. Lord Jesus, for your glory. Amen. Y'all sound so wonderful at singing. I'm so blessed to hear you sing each week and have that wonderful choir behind us. So bless the Lord for your wonderful voices. Brother Mike Burge has been attending church here for about two years, and the Lord has led him to join membership here at Union Baptist Church. Brother Mike, what was the name of the church your membership is at? Uh, First Baptist Church, Bay St. Louis. First Baptist, Bay St. Louis. That's where his membership is supposed to be since 1958, but... Uh, Hurricanes have happened, and they're not sure if the records got wiped out, but we'll contact them. So either he will be coming.